guys, so it is the same night, it's Friday night, it's, uh, no, actually it's Saturday now, it's uh, 24 minutes past 12, so it's not the same night as the night I was recording the video on Taoism, um, which I got terribly wrong and said Taoism started in 2500 BC, we're going to blame that on the beer, um, it was started around 500 BC, but I mistakenly said 2500 BC, because I was working it out from now, because it was 2,500 years ago. Anyway, always the way in it. So, um, got my beer. Uh, I've had a few beers, so <laughs> I won't lie. This video isn't going to be the um, most, I was going to say disoriented. I mean the most oriented um, video in the world. But I'm not drunk, so, well, you know, okay. And these beers are very weak alcohol anyway, so it's not like it's crazy. So, um, I just wanted to briefly talk about love and um, the whole crushes thing. I've got about, oh, I've not got a watch. I've got about 35 minutes until the second takeaway of the night arrives. I already had a takeaway earlier on. Now we're getting another one. Uh, last time it was a halloumi burger and chips quite nice curly fries with some sort of spices on, some sort of dry seasoning on. This time it's a um, veggie burger with mayo and salad and chips and a tango, which will be quite interesting. Anyway, um, so love. What What is love? One sec, let me just tilt that down. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it's going to be a weird video this one. So love, what is love? Um, it's one of those weird things that we always philosophize about and always think that there's something to when actually it's this very airy fairy concept that is actually rather a disjointed, uh, misunderstood, not really whole in a particular way. It isn't some spherical, whole, lovely, round, perfect thing or it isn't some sort of diamond or some sort of pearl. Um, it's very, very odd and um, uh, disjointed, it's very very up in the air, it's, it's very weird. Also, uh, the flatmates are messing around out there, listening to music, laughing, all the rest of it, so apologies if you can hear that. Um, just put it down to student life, you know. Um, anyway, so uh, it is this weird thing, you know, there isn't, you can't literally put your finger, for example, I can put my finger on this mic here, tangible, easy, you know, it's obviously based in the objective world, in the external world, whereas love, you, you can't really do that, it's this kind of, uh, it's almost, in, in a way, although it isn't quite this, but it's almost a hypothetical construct, it's not a hypothetical construct, because we can actually measure emotional reactions, um, in the brain, and obviously, therefore, we can we can know the the subjective phenomena phenomena of love. We can see that in an objective setting. Um, so, therefore, it's not really a hypothetical construct. But the kind of the the experience of love is so up in the air and so kind of um, oh, I'm getting a knock. One second. Yeah. Going out. I'm just recording a video. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I want to record a video. Okay. So I'll see you in a minute. Yeah. See ya. They were just going out for a smoke and we wanted to see if I come. Don't worry, I don't smoke. Only on special occasions. Or I might have a cheeky little vape every now and again. But we you know, anyway. So, um love. So it, it, it is this up in the air thing, it's this really weird, weird, you know, thing. Um, and people can categorise it psychologically and we can say, well, oh, well, you know, if we're going to say the beginnings of love, the beginnings of love have a uh, uh, spark, let's say, in a psychological projection, otherwise known uh, as, well, not otherwise known as a crush because psychological projection takes many, many different forms. But in this particular case of talking about psychological projection, we're talking about a crush. So obviously what you do in psychological terms is you project onto someone else uh, something within your own psyche. 
some sort of part of you you project out onto that person sometimes if you're unconscious of yourself and if you're not very self-aware um, it might be even if to be honest even if you are very self-aware you can still project a, a deficiency inside your own your own personality onto someone else and then what what happens basically as you can observe it empirically is maybe let's say you're not i'll give you an example from my from my own life from my own experience personally i'm not really that integrated with my rebellious nature it's why often on videos i always feel the need to say oh i'm i'm rebellious or oh i'm this or I'm that you know it's overcompensation right so anyway um if i've not got that like integration of that part of me in my own personality then of course i'm going to project that on other people now that projection may take the form of onto other guys who i'm friends with or it may take the form of onto girls who i um obviously have an attraction towards and of course everyone does this with partners or with uh people who are friends or for people who you, who you would want to be more than friends with um it's kind of as if there's subtleties that you don't accept in yourself that you project onto that other person and it's a way of almost not accepting yourself because you don't you, you, there's something blocking you there's something in your psyche that's blocking you from accepting that part of yourself and so it's easier to unconsciously project it onto someone else and then you end up getting into a relationship and actually what you realize ultimately is the thing that you're in love with or what you sometimes can realize not all the time if it's a proper true relationship that is but sometimes you can realize that the thing you're actually in love with is the part of your personality that you were projecting out and actually the person themselves didn't hold anything they were simply just a vessel for the psychological projection now that's a case of more of a crush that is uh, in which the person you project onto doesn't hold any sim similar interest doesn't hold any real uh, connection with you in, in particular now when we talk about love after the psychological projection after we've we've got rid of those crush ideas and those projection ideas and those deficiencies that you're projecting out when we talk about proper love then we're talking about a connection that has built up obviously in each of the brains of the individuals involved um it's almost as if the brain specializes in a certain way for the people involved now we can talk about this subjectively with regards to um memories and with regards to um the ability of two individuals to actually become or gain traits of the other person because they've been with each other for a long time so quite obvious to observe this in people who've been to let's say someone's been together 10 years with someone um now both of those individuals have changed a lot because of the relationship because of those two people being in the vicinity of, of each other for a long time period for example if i was to get into a relationship now in 10 years i would be a very different person because that other person in the relationship has affected me has affected my mentality has affected my um interests affected my uh, what I do in in life, all these different things, because decisions come mutually and and experiences become uh, are also mutual, and so therefore, or it's almost as if the brains of those two individuals have matured together, have specialised, have individualised um, to take on board traits of the other, and then that comes out subjectively, um, and obviously memories have been built up in the hippocampus the amygdala has been active like hundreds of thousands of times with these very very powerful emotions based on experiences that you've had together in the same vicinity of one another and so that's going to cause a, a connection between these two individual brains um and therefore that's real that whether, whether we're talking from a neuro, neuropsychological perspective or whether we're talking from um 
just kind of uh, a subjective perspective that is real uh, and that is more what we could class as love in a hard rigid factual thinking logical manner you know if we're going to be rigorous in such a way um uh, and so uh, there is certainly something called love there we something we can observe as love uh, it's not just this airy fairy up in the air kind of concept that is um it's really nothing but an ephem as what I would consider an ephemeral illusion. Now, for a very, very long time in my life, I can sit. Well, no, I didn't consider love as, a, as an ephemeral illusion. For a very, very long time in my life, I would have crushes on people, and it would be very intense, and it would be very um, disjointed as well. In Jungian terms. Uh, we would say that my psychic puberty, if you will, uh, was distorted because of many different complexes. And so it, it, that didn't help the psychological projection onto different individuals. And the, the kind of the, uh, I suppose, voraciousness is the right word. Of all, I'd have to Google that word again because I've not used that word in a long time. But the fierceness of it, that's what I'm trying to say. The fierceness of that. Uh, those projections and, and also the numerous amounts of those projections uh, were, were really quite disjointed. And so I used to have a concept called uh, love transference, which actually would be better described as projection transference, which means the psychological projection that you've got on one person, which in normal terms is the crush, uh, is transferred to another person um, via experience with the two individuals so for example uh if you could if you can if you have a crush on one person then what you can do is you can cut that person out of your life and then transfer the psychic energy that you've bound up in that individual that has then been going around in your mind in your thoughts so imagine that during the projection you've got the psychic energy or mental energy if you will is then bound up in the idea of that person. In Freudian terms, it's a carfixis. I can never pronounce the word, but it's C-A-T-H-E-X-I-S. I think, yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I can ne never pronounce it. Carfixis or something like that anyway, which is the bound, bounding, binding up of uh, psychic energy in an idea, in a person, even in a place really as well. Um, and so what happens is, you've got this kind of um, uh, bounded up of, of mental energy in that person. So they're running through your thoughts all the time. You can't, you can't get out of that. And it impedes your ability to function as well in the everyday. You, maybe you're going to work and you're typing something and suddenly they're on your mind and that person, you just can't get them out of your mind. And it seems like it's completely blowing your psyche to shreds. It's like, I can't function. My mind is just all over the place. Why, why is this happening? All the rest of it. And that's what it is. But what you can do is you can, uh, cut the person somewhat out of your life or just don't talk to them as much if you can. And then shift the project. I mean, this is very, very, I mean, there's psychopathological elements to this, of course, but um, you can remove them a little bit, then transfer the projection onto another person, transfer the crush onto another person, and that's then what we would consider, what I, I termed when I was like 13, 14, as love transference, but a better uh, terminology for it would be projection transference. Um, but it wasn't, it probably wasn't until I was like 21, 22, well, 22, when I really started to understand the illusion or, or really start to get really, really fixated on this idea that love is an illusion, doesn't exist. It's a load of airy-fairy crap that doesn't even exist. It's simply projection. It's all projection. So I went through this phase of uh, being very, very satisfied with myself, this idea that, um, oh, yes, love is simply a projection. And, yeah, it's great because what you can just do is pull away the projections and in some sort of meditative state like a Pratyeka Buddha or something like that. Actually, I think it's Pratyana Buddha. Sorry, again, I've had a few beers. So, anyway, uh, I think it's a Prat Pratyeka, Pratyeka, Pratyeka Buddha, um, which is a Buddha, a private Buddha, one who basically... Um, uh, 
they can attain enlightenment, they can t- attain uh, Satori, and then they just go away and they they have that for themselves, basically. Whereas the opposite of that is, well, not the opposite, but the other Buddha is a Bodhisattva, which is one who can attain enlightenment, but then puts off attaining it and comes back to the world and helps other people, essentially, gain enlightenment, even though they can just go away into, into well, not Nova Kampa Samadhi, uh, well, Kind of Peri Nirvana, but also it's Peri Nirvana. Um, Nirvana, Peri Nirvana. Um, it's like Nirvana is like enlightenment, but then Peri Nirvana is like a, a, a supreme enlightenment, let's say. Anyway, so um, that's kind of the, the concept of the Bodhisattva. So, anyway, I thought to myself, well, you know, I could just get rid of all these projections and then just sit here absorbing in in reality and then not love and all the rest of it because if you don't start the projection in causal terms in uh, in causality then love doesn't happen and therefore it's 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 an illusion that i can control but the fact is really there is some solid grounding an objective grounding for love being a reality in your brain now of course philosophically speaking we can say well yes but the brain is subject to entropy and death and decay and all the rest of it so therefore that's an illusion in itself and yes okay in buddhist terms in philosophical terms um then we could say that and we could state that and it's very valid in those terms but a lot of people don't think like that a lot of people think in terms of your organism as being permanent, not not um, temporary or an illusion. Even though we know that obviously we're going to die, and it is it is an, our bodies are an illusion, a, temp, a temporary illusion of well, we could say a temporary illusion of temporality. Um, but you know, we we still think of them as being permanent and solid. Um, and so to respect that view and that way of thinking because it is very valid um we can then affirm the fact that well actually love is um something more than just this projection it's something objective it's something that does have worth um and even let's say we are subject to entropy decay and death um the the individual's brain the, the each individual's brain um has its own structure has its own patterning that is formulated over the lifespan and uh, therefore that in itself in that specific time scale does have a sense of permanence in the fact that it is individual it is individualized and there won't be ever another one of them and that in a sense has within it if you read between the lines an odd sense of permanence there because it'll never happen again. It's kind of like permanence in impermanence. It's, it's weird. It's because it's never going to happen again. So it's almost like that one thing is a permanent, I don't know, a permanent point of eternity in ephemerality. It's a really weird thing. It's very, very hard to get your head around actually, but it is almost like that it is almost like that and um there is an element of of permanence in it so anyway that's just a few of my thoughts on love uh i've philosophized on love for well indirectly for about 11 years now i suppose uh, 11 12 years um but more directly for probably the last three years so um yeah i've got my takeout coming in about 10 10 minutes 13 minutes something like that so um yeah you know it's very interesting one love it's very 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 fascinating i mean we can also talk about i suppose very briefly um the idea of 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 who to love of uh, psychologically speaking who to love uh philosophically speaking how do we find the right person i mean i think this idea of the right person is a load of crap to be honest um in terms of this the one the absolute one i think that's an idealistic illusion that people just delude themselves with because actually they're just scared to go out there and experience life in in the more normal form of of how it takes for example um in the more just everyday kind of oh yeah it's not very ideal but you know we can gain some sort of happiness out of it but a lot of people these days like to 
idolize, 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 fantasize, 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 and um, and not actually experience. And the only reason I know that is because I've done that for so long, so I can be very well uh, aware that people do that. Um, so yeah, I don't really believe in this idea of the one. Um, although there is interesting ideas within uh, the psyche, within Jung the Jungian conception of the unconscious that um, make you think that uh, there's these kind of fatalistic ideas going on in the unconscious that almost pull you towards certain individuals and other individuals are pulled towards you in a sense. Um, it's more of a kind of, uh, I've used this uh, expression before in another video, a metaphysical intuition rather than anything particularly solid. But when you interpret your dreams, you can you can start to see these little patterns, patterning systems in your unconscious. And if you can also, in, if you can also talk to other people about their dreams, you can also see these little patternings that are coming together and stuff. It's very, very, very hard to do. It's very, you know, and obviously you have to have friends who you can talk to about your dreams and you can talk to about their dreams as well. Uh, and that's a hard thing, gaining people like that is, is friendships. But yeah, there's, there's interesting things like that. And then, and so there, those, those are the little subtle things that I start to think, well, if I'm going to believe in some sort of fatalism with regards to love or anything like that, that's the way I would, that's the argument I would, I would call upon. And that's something that I would say, well, if I was believing in it, that's something, that's something. But, uh, I don't want to commit to that so much because, I've made a lot of mistakes and a lot of follies with dream interpretation. I made a lot of errors of judgment and um, certain times I've thought about dreams in ways that are of the nature of the emotions of someone else. So for example, when, when let's say I would see a family member or I'd see a friend in a dream, I may interpret it as that dream actually relating to the unconscious of that other individual in sort of like a transpersonal way. It's very, very hard to interpret dreams in such a manner. The only way you can interpret dreams transpersonally is if you've got two individuals with a complex and um, the individuals are therefore linked by that complex, not in a transpersonal manner through some sort of telekinesis or what a tele, uh, telepathic manner, rather not telekinesis, a telepathic manner, I should say. Um, but actually just because the complex has cemented itself in the brains of the individual, in, in the brains of the individuals through mutually shared experiences that connect the brains of the individual up, um, by obviously, uh, being in the vicinity of one another over an extended time period and having negative experiences, which connect a complex based on instinct between the two. Uh, case the very strong case and point for this is the mother complex where the son responds to the maternal instinct to the mother and because of the certain experiences over childhood and over teenage years uh, that the two individuals in that complex are bonded um, and it, it's not a transpersonal or, or metaphysical or airy fairy idea it is very real uh, and you could validate it on a neuropsychological uh, basis. It, it would be hard to actually try and validate it fully, but you can certainly observe it empirically and you could try and validate it and you'd probably get somewhere. Um, and obviously all the psychoanalysts know very well the Oedipal complex and the Electra complex and all the rest of it. Although, of course, it is kind of, um, in the scientific community, it's kind of dismissed a bit of, oh, that's the old psychiatrist stuff you know but it's a very very dangerous thing to do dismissing it as we do currently in research psychology and scientific psychology because um it's a, it's a very very prevalent thing it's a very very common thing uh, and I've, I've said it before and i'll say it again why do you think there's so much um mother son porn and why do you think there's so much father daughter porn it's because it, 
in the unconscious of many, many, many people, there's all these mother complexes, Oedipal complexes, Electra complexes, father complexes, um, and even there's there's complexes working, even mother complexes and father complexes working in individuals who right now are 42 years old and they've got their own life and they've maybe got even a wife or whatever it may be. It's not that these people are living in their parents' bedroom, uh, or any, sorry, basement, but these people have got maybe lives of their own, but they're still attached to these complexes um, because of maybe childhood experiences or, or experiences in teenagehood. And it's a it's not a not a great thing. I mean, there's many, 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 many people like that. And yes, while they can function and while they have some level of their own life, there's always this complex just working in the background in the unconscious. That would be the typical mild version of a, of a mother complex because obviously the person's managed to get away and got their own life. A more high-grade mother complex, as Jung would call it, um, would would be more like the son or the or let's say the daughter if it's father complex um it, it, you, they just can't get away they just they won't be able to get away from the from the parents or from the mother or whatever it, it, it's going to be very very hard uh, and it comes out in the behavior it comes out in their moods it comes out in anger and frustration and there's tension between the parents and the child and it's messy it, it's really messy and the, the dreams the dreams of the individuals are just not not nice dreams um so there's a lot of that that goes on anyway but i don't know where i was going anyway um with with this particularly i don't know anyway i was talking about um personality and finding the one wasn't I so so let's get back to that a little bit before I wrap up because we're 26 minutes now and I've got the takeout coming in five minutes now um but you know I don't think it matters too much about this idea of finding the one or being uh, idealizing or anything because if you've got all these projections out there and you can recognize each of these projections as I was talking about before about how an individual will project maybe a deficit of their own personality something they don't uh, accept in their own personality onto someone else tip uh, case in point it's why i go for rebellious girls because i don't accept the rebellious nature of myself so um, i project that out you see but now i, I I've, I've only just started to really come to terms with that and now i'm a bit better with it and i don't project necessarily as much onto those types of women um but yeah, so the, there's all this kind of thing. And let's say you have managed to withdraw quite a lot of those projections and you accept quite a large portion of who you are, of yourself, of your real personality, not the things you just want to accept about yourself. Oh, I'm a lovely, nice person who's all this. Or, oh, I'm a really evil person because maybe you like to think of yourself as evil but not nice. Um, then, uh, you know, once you've accepted all of these different facets to your personality and withdrawn those projections, or maybe you don't like to think of yourself as particularly heroic, maybe you like to think of yourself in a different manner, um, but essentially once you've withdrawn all of these, then um, uh, you can pursue a relationship not based on this ideal or this fantasy or this the one, um, you can pursue a relationship not on a specific way or a specific manner of person. You're not looking specifically for a certain type of person. You're just looking for someone to share your life with. And whoever that may be, whoever comes into your life and you naturally feel something for, and then you can get beyond that, that initial projection, let's say, and you can understand... Uh, after that n initial projection that we all get, which is that little crush, um, then you can understand, right, once I've withdrawn that projection, is this really love? And chances are in that particular circumstance, it, it, it may be. And then you can share your life with that person. But there's a lot of kind of childish stuff that goes on with love. And uh, no doubt there's thousands, I say thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people out there who are in long-term relationships with people who actually have a projection on them, a sustained projection over a very, very long time period, um, and who actually don't accept certain things in their own personality that they're proje still projecting out onto their spouse even after 20 years. Now, 
Um, obviously, uh, that can cause mood swings, arguments, you know, in, in, in its maybe slightly more prevalent form, but it will, because it's affecting the unconscious of the individual, it almost works like a little mild complex, if you will. Um, it's obviously not a severe complex or anything, but it just works as like a little mild complex and it affects behavior, it affects moods because they're projecting part of themselves out onto the other person. And when the other person, their spouse, doesn't align with that, they get annoyed, they get moody, they get, uh, their emotions go all over the place and stuff because that person isn't aligning with who you want them to be. And really, who you want them to be is the part of you that you don't accept. And because you haven't accepted it, you're getting moody over the fact that they're not being who you actually want to be. You see, I'm very, I, I, I know very full well the certain parts to me that I don't want to be. I never wanted to be a rebel, really. I never wanted to be an evil bastard. Well, okay, maybe I did a bit. But anyway, I didn't really want to be a, a, a rebel or be certain things. But I've had to accept these in my personality just so that then I don't project onto other people and get all emotions all over the place and everything. And uh, get into a state of, of being that is uh, uncentered or, or um, a bit just, you know, um, prone to projection and prone to not accepting parts of myself. Um, so it's very, you know, we really have to think about this in society about how we're going to really look at love and how we're going to actually proceed with love so that then we can actually... Uh, be conscious. This is the real kicker. Be conscious of our love. And if we're not conscious of our love, then the unconscious can come in and, and dictate our action, dictate our behavior and our moods, um, uh, without us knowing and, and give us these mood swings and give us these complexes. Um, and, and it's a bad thing. You know, it's not, it really isn't a good thing. So anyway, that I'll leave it there. We're, we're over 30 minutes now. So uh, thank you very much for watching. I'm going to go and get my takeaway. It would be very nice. Uh, finish off this beer. Uh, we're one minute. So I think Josh actually just said uh, a minute ago, walking down the hall, where's Adam? So I don't know. Maybe the takeout's come. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I'm surprised it's not knocked on my door, though. So maybe it hasn't. Um, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you want to leave a comment down below, please do so. And I will see you in the next one. See you very soon, guys.